Amen. Thank God. God is good. This morning, I invite your prayerful attention to the book of Genesis, chapter number two. That's right. Genesis chapter number two, we're at the beginning of the year, we're going to the beginning of the book. <laughs> Amen. When you have it, say amen. amen. Let's begin reading at verse 6 down through uh, verse 15. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. Join me. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Continue. there is a gold and the gold of that land is good there is delium and onyx stone and the name of the second river is Gihon the same is it that encompasses the whole land of Ethiopia and the name of the third river is Hydokol that is it which goeth toward the east of Assyria and the fourth river is Euphrates and the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Can you say amen? amen? Verse eight is where I want you to focus your attention. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden and there he put the man whom he had formed. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden and there he put the man whom he had formed. Can you say amen? This simple subject, just look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, God has a plan for your life. Tell the other neighbor, because they've been wandering, doing whatever they wanted to do. But God has a plan for your life. It doesn't matter how you feel about it. It doesn't matter what you think about it. It doesn't matter what you plan for yourself. It's not up to your emotions. It's not up to your mom and them. It's not up to your mood swings. God has a plan for your life. You can fight it. You can kick it. You can run from it. You can wrestle with it. But nevertheless, the truth is still there. God has a plan for your life. You'll never have peace. You'll never have joy. You'll never have contentment until you begin to understand the magnitude and the depth of the plan that God has for your life. Say that with me. God has a plan for my life. Say it again. God has a plan for my life. You need to let every devil know, every obstacle know, every problem go, every apathetical, lackadaisical attitude know, God has a plan for my life. My God. Isn't that something? I mean, just think about it. Don't take it for granted. Just think about it a minute. That God would have a plan. First of all, that God would even think about you. That God would even care about you in the first place. To sit down and devise a strategy and orchestrate a plan for you. God has a plan, not just for the universe, not just for the galaxies, not just for the hemispheres, the stratospheres, the atmosphere, but God has a plan for your life. Say it again. God has a plan for my life. People are dying for the lack of that one statement. They live their life as if there is no plan. 
They're making mistakes for the lack of the understanding of that one statement. Everybody's looking in their emotions to make decisions. You can't trust your emotions to make decisions. Your emotions are crazy. My emotions are crazy. They will vary and vacillate from day to day. Every day you feel different. Sometimes you feel different between breakfast and lunch. Come on, somebody. Used to be a song they sing, sometimes you feel like a nut. <laughs> you know, you know, sometimes you feel like a Christian. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you feel prayerful. Sometimes you feel on top of your game. Sometimes you feel like you got the victory. I'm not talking about feelings. I'm talking about facts. I'm talking about God having a plan for your life. Some things didn't happen, so it's not in the plan. Thought you'd have been further sooner, so it wasn't in the plan. God, help me to line my plan up with your plan so we're not fighting against each other as if I knew what to do. Lord, you know I'm a dummy. Give me a manual, life for dummies. Keep it simple, make it plain, shout it clear, because if you don't, I'm going to blow it up. Help me to understand that you have a plan for my life. I've tripped over my own foot. I've messed up myself. I've made mistakes in the past. I'm going into a new year. I don't want to have an old attitude. Help me to walk in the plan that you have for my life. God, good God, I feel the anointing. I haven't even started on it. God has a plan. God has a plan for your life. Father, I thank you for the opportunity you've given me to talk to the flock this morning. And I pray in the name of Jesus that the word would be made flesh. Use me, Lord, as only you can to bless and deliver and strengthen your people. I thank you for the plan that you have. Help me to share it with your people today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Glory to God. The other day, I think it was Wednesday night, my wife and I were sitting in church and Pastor uh, Twiggs was teaching out of the Word of God and while she was teaching, she flipped past uh, the scripture as she was sharing things relative to tithing. And the scripture, the eighth verse just leaped out of the page at me and I shared it with my wife. I didn't talk about it, I just showed her the scripture. I said, look at that. And she said, I said, okay, so I didn't want to start whispering while the teaching was going on, but, but when I read my Bible, certain things leap out at me. And it can be things I've read thousands of times before, but it just leaps out at me that particular time because God is going to use that scripture somewhere in my life. And, and this just jumped out and said, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Hmm. Gosh, that blesses me. There he, he, there he put the man whom he had formed. There he put the man whom he had formed. He, first of all, God didn't put the man in the place until he prepared the man for the place. And I want to talk about this, this word form, this, this, this preparatory process that God takes us through to make us what we ought to be. And I believe with all of my heart, sometimes now when, 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 I, when I speak or teach or preach or whatever it is I do, sometimes I'm kind of intimidated because my thoughts are so full that it's difficult to get in words. So just bear with me a, a, a little. I believe that one of the problems that we're having as a church uh, and when I say church, I mean globally, not this individual church, but even as this generation is that we want everything quick. We want everything quick. We want everything quick. Nothing is fast enough. 
nothing is fast enough. I mean, it's not fast enough. You know, it, it's not fa The phones have to be faster. Our, our previous generation were, were glad to have a phone. And the phone, it took you, you had to know who you were calling. You didn't want to get the number wrong because beep, beep, beep. Then you had a party line, but everybody was into it. It was no problem. Then they got push button, you know, and then they got push button. What for you push button? Then they went to speed dial. You know, not, you know, now it's just getting faster and faster and faster. Everything fast. We want success fast. We want careers fast. We want great marriages fast. We want great children fast. We want everything fast. We don't want to wait on anything. We want everything quick. Get in, get out, get it over with quick. And then you die. What were you in such a hurry about? I mean, think about it, man. When you get through rushing, you rush right on and slide right into the grave and shut up. But we are in a big hurry to get there. The truth of the matter is, God prepares you. Preparation takes time. He was only working with dirt. And it takes a little while, you know, when you're working with dirt to, to, to start the preparation. I'm going to talk to you about four things and I'll be out of your way. And the first one is preparation. God is preparing you. God is preparing you. And that process may be painful. It may be revealing. It may deal with debris, areas in your life of inconsistencies. It may take time. That preparation may have gone through the bulk of your life. The bulk of your life. God may have spent 10, 15, 20 years preparing you. I want to be just, just cut right to it because you want to come in here and have somebody lay hands on you and ta-ta-ta over your head and you're prepared. That is not real life. <laughs> Preparing you is critical. It's a process. It takes a long time. Believe me, it takes longer to prepare a good meal than it does to eat one. <laughs> Preparation, process. Dealing with areas, personality defects, areas of distrust, dislikes, intimidations, childhood issues, scars, burdens, flaws. Preparation takes a long time. I've given up on dating how long it takes to grow up. If I would have known this, I'm not sure we would have had so many children. I thought, you know, you birth them, you have them, you raise them, you feed them. I didn't realize that, that 18 means nothing. 21 means nothing. 30 may mean nothing. Then when I look at me, maybe 40 means nothing. Can we be honest? How many of you, even at your age, still recognize some childish ways in you? Anybody else would have given up on the project but God. God has such a plan for your life that he is committed to the project of assuming the responsibility wherever your parents laid uh, uh, quit or laid off or stopped doing what they were supposed to doing at that point, God even continues the process to make sure you get everything you need. This is a wonderful element of worship because we come to him knowing that we are not finished, that we are a work in progress and he continues to develop us. I think people should wear a sign on their head that says work in progress. If you hire me, you have to know that. If you marry me, you have to know that. If I'm your father, you have to know that. If I'm your child, you have to know that. He is not finished with me. How long is it gonna take? I don't know. People will rush you through your process while they meander through theirs. I'm not talking about little nice, minor, uh, minute issues. I'm talking about issues that undermine your success, seemingly delay your purpose, 
issues that you struggle with that, that once people get to know you, most of them leave you? Because they are not committed to your forming. I wish we could do this. I wish we could teach this to every person fixing to get married. We now pronounce you man and wife. Tuh. <laughs> tuh, tuh, tuh. You go home with that and spend a honeymoon with that and then get down to the real building bricks of turning that into a real wife and him into a real husband may take you 15 years. They're a husband and wife. No, they're man and woman. The next 10 or 15 years will make you husband and wife. Committed to the process. God is committed to the process. He formed man from the dust of the earth. Do you realize what God had to work with when he got a hold to you? Do you know that the tools that God uses you, not what he used with Adam, but the tools that God uses with you to form you are the experiences that you confront in your life? That everything you confront is shaping you in some way, altering you, and that the pushings and the indentations and the changes take you out of your comfort zone because God is forming you? I don't mean the day-to-day -day honking in traffic somebody got on your nerves. I mean the loss of the job. I mean the thing that broke your heart. I mean coming to your wit's end. I mean the time you struggled to get out of the bed in the morning. I mean those crises that hit you in life that you thought were killing you and somehow you survived and you're still trying to figure out why I survived and how I made it. It's because God wasn't trying to kill you. He was trying to shape you. And we are by nature so stubborn and so rebellious and so cynical. If life doesn't push you real hard, you don't move. The Bible teaches that you could make this, you could cut down the forming process years, years, years. Incidentally, you don't have a whole lot of years. You could cut down the process years by obeying the word. You could cut, because the word tells you where he's going with this. That's why you hear the word. The word doesn't come to tell you what you are. You are not what we're preaching. I'm not what I'm preaching. The guys who wrote the book were not what they're preaching. The word tells you the plan of God. This is the design. This is the architectural design of where God wants you to end up. And then you get the word and then life starts pushing you into what the word already said. Oh, y'all aren't ready for truth. See, see, most of the church doesn't really want to hear about truth. We want to talk about ideals, concepts. But the reality is the Word of God reveals what the master plan is. The problems and the adversity in life begin to whip you into the plan. And how fast you turn in it determines how fast you're ready for the next stage. The more you keep trying to have it your way, the longer it's going to take. It may take you three years to get through playing with people. It may take you five years to stop feeling sorry for yourself or 10 years or 20 years to stop going back into your childhood, playing in the toy chest or what you went through before. It may take you a year. All the while the word was saying, stop it, stop it, stop it. All the while you said, yeah, I know, I know. I'm gonna do better, I'm gonna do better. All the while still going over to it. And then finally, 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 something slaps you upside the head and you say, you know what? I'm forgetting those things which are behind and I'm reaching to those things which are before. God said, I told you that 20 years ago and, and what I'm trying to get you to see I think you know that God formed Adam from the dust of the earth and I think you understand metaphorically what that means to you but I'm not sure you understand that the instruments that he uses are the crisis you confront and he wouldn't have to use the crises you confront if you would heed the word that you're taught. 
But many, many times we're taught the word in a distracted way. Or we're taught the word just so that we can, we, we go to church and we hear it, but we don't really make it applicable to what we're going through. Or we hear the word, shout over it, and don't try to do it. So when, when we don't respond to the word, circumstances have to push us. And circumstances, many of us are so strong-willed that even when things don't work out right, we keep doing them wrong anyway. We are committed to messing up. I mean, how many times will you keep getting tied up with the wrong person? How many times will you let your temper fly off the handle and make your mouth say things that set you back and you know you do it. You apologize for doing it. You sent flowers for doing it. You cried over doing it, but you keep doing it. All of the, the more you resist that, the longer the formation takes. That's why when Jesus got to the cross, you don't see Jesus fighting with the cross. I rebuke death. I come against it. I come against this pain. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Jesus was the first man on the cross to die. First man out. He became obedient unto death. He submitted quickly so that he could get through the forming process. God help us to submit quickly so that we can get through the forming process. My prayer often is, Lord, what am I supposed to learn out of this so that I don't do this same stupid thing again? What do I need to know about me that I didn't know? What do I need to know about people that I didn't know? And what do I need to know about you that I didn't know? Help me to figure it out so I don't flunk this course and have to take this class over again. I didn't like this. You know how when your little children they have you read the story and then they ask you what was the moral of the story? Many of us go through issue after issue after issue, but we never draw a conclusion as to what was the moral of the story. What was I supposed to come out of this learning? And we delay the forming process. We delay the preparatory process, and we're not prepared. And because we're not prepared, the blessing is delayed. This takes time. If you're going to work with anybody in any capacity, you have to understand before you go in, this is a work in process. I don't care what the advertisement looks like. I don't care how great the commercial is. I don't care what they drove up in. I don't care what university they went to. I don't care if they're so beautiful that you asphyxiate when they walk in the room. Still a work in process. And over a period of time, you're going to see that there's still something that's protruding that needs to be leveled, and something that's leveled that needs to be raised, and something that's hollow that needs to be filled. And everybody in here has something hollow that needs to be filled, something protruding that needs to be flattened, some arrogance, some pride, some ego, some puffed up disposition that needs to be flattened. And most of us, it may take you 5, 10, 15 years to finally let the air out of that stuff that keeps making you do dumb stuff. When God got the man prepared, the next thing he did, and this is amazing, this is amazing to me, God planted a garden eastward in Eden. For the prepared man, God, I want to talk to step two, God planted. God planted everything else in the book of Genesis, God created, God spoke to, God declared, but when it came to the garden, he skillfully planted. Planted. What is it to plant? To plant is to bury seeds beyond human view so that they could germinate and produce life. Planted blessings. Number two, planted blessings. 
<laughs> in God's plan for your life he has planted blessings just because you walk out in the field and you don't see the crop doesn't mean that the seeds haven't been planted planted blessings buried beneath the dirty stuff planted blessings planted blessings God planted blessings in your life that you have not seen yet it's amazing it's amazing it's amazing that God would plan why would he even go to such trouble he could just speak but look at the love look at the personal involvement that the creator of the universe stoops down and starts planting little secret blessings to come up at different seasons in your life. See, when you plant a garden, everything doesn't come up at the same time. Will you hear me when I tell you that everything that God has for you hasn't come up yet? You can't walk away on life and say, well, this is all there is to my career. This is all there is to my life. This is all God has for me in Dallas. Don't you know, dummy, that God's got some stuff planted that you haven't seen yet? Why do you think he wrote, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has entered the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him? It's planted. It's planted. God planted a garden eastward in Eden. There are blessings planted for you that you haven't tasted yet. No, I'm not. You know, what's that thing we say? I'm, I'm not what I used to be. I'm not what I, I'm going to be, but thank God I'm not what I used to be. Let me show you something. There are many of us who are still becoming what he planted. And what we want out of life, what we want out of people, what we want out of God, what we want out of sermons, is for somebody to see things in us that haven't come up yet. First of all, it reinforces our faith that it will come up. Secondly, it fascinates us that somebody believes in you before you get there. Everybody will get with you when you get there, believe me. Can I just pop a talk like you talk to the kids, you know? Believe me, when it comes up, everybody will come. Everybody. People you never thought will show up. You'll get relatives you don't even know how you're related to them. They come out of the woodwork. You got all kinds of friends. When it comes up, anybody will come. What you need is somebody to go through the germination process with you while you are becoming what God would have you to be. Can you hear me up in here? Mm. Look at your neighbor and say, there are things in you that haven't come up yet. There are talents in you that haven't come up in you yet. There are dreams in you that haven't come up yet. How do you know? Because God just said he planted them. He planted them if God planted them, they have to be there. The devil is fighting you, not over where you are, he's fighting you over where you're going. He knows what has been planted in your life and he's trying to kill your seed. Don't let the enemy kill your seed. In fact, don't let life kill your seed. If you're not careful, life will kill you. I know that sounds like an oxymoron. It sounds totally ridiculous because life is supposed to live you, but life will kill you. Don't let life kill your seed. Oh God, don't let life 
kill what God has planted inside of you. God's planted things in your garden that you're supposed to find over time. No, you're not going to get everything today. No, I'm not the man I'll be 10 years from now or five years from now or five months from now because there is a time factor in the planting process. Everything doesn't come to harvest at the same time. So you have to have patience because if you don't have patience, you won't get everything that God has for you. Don't you know that the enemy comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy, and he wants to rob you and those you love from reaping the benefits of what God planted in your life. This, this message won't touch you if you don't have enough faith to believe that something is planted in you. But if you believe I got something in me, I don't care what I make on the monthly check. I don't care what the neighbor said about me. I don't care what it looks like in my community. I have something planted in me. That's why I love my job. I love my job because I just go around watering. I just go around just watering. And sometimes you water stuff, somebody, nothing comes up. Because God doesn't always let you see where the seeds are. So you can't pick who you water. And you end up watering everybody so that somebody I just water everybody, the drug addicts, the dope dealers, homosexuals, lesbians, whoremongers, backbiters, bigots, deceitful, it don't make no difference what it is, the gambler, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, I don't care about the dirt, I'm after the seed, and if the water gets beneath the dirt, it'll hit the seed, and you can't tell who's got the seed, sometimes it's in a child, Sometimes it's in a woman. Sometimes it's in a black man, a white man, a red man, an old woman. Grandma may still be pregnant like Sarah with a seed down in her womb. Just because you're older doesn't mean you got all your seeds out. So now let me talk to you. God prepared the man. Number two, God planted the seeds. Number three, God placed the man in the garden he had planted. Somebody shout, place me. <laughs> place me in my garden eastward in Eden a directive a particular place it's not enough to be in Eden eastward in Eden place me in my garden not here if not her if not here if place me in my garden. Place me in my garden. Place me in my garden. Good God. Place me in my garden. I've learned more about God raising children than I have reading the Bible. It's a great revelation, raising children, watching them come into their own, watching them stumble and try to find their way. And you're older and you're saying, just turn left. 
but you can't cut through the process they have to stumble because even in the stumbling they're learning something in the stumbling that they have to go through to find their way how many of you work several jobs before you figured out what you were supposed to do weren't placed yet just wandering Maybe it's this, maybe it's that. I like this, I kind of like that. What they go through, we all go through. God, don't let me spend my life trying stuff. Place me. I tell my children, the kids you are worried about now, you will not remember their name. You won't even remember their name. So stop crying. It really doesn't matter. It is not the end of the world. This is just a game you're playing called growing up. And when you get through playing the game, you're going to put all the pieces in the box. And be placed. And some of you, I know this through the Spirit, some of you are just coming into this stage where you are being placed. That's why the resume, if I read a resume of your life, it wouldn't tell me anything except stuff you tried. And now, after God working with you and working on you and working through you and pressing down your ego and building up your low self-esteem and sanding off what happened to you and sanding off what got attached to you and putting you in a place, you're just now getting in the place where God is planted. Place me. Somebody say, place me. Place. Now, now let me explain something to you now. Go back because we got to pick up a piece. When God places you, you can't always tell with the eyes, the ears, the smell, the senses, the taste that you're in the place because the place that God used, everything else God just spoke to. But when it came to this place, he planted So you could be in the place and because it is planted, it may not look like the place because it's going to take time for it to come up. This is how the enemy will rob you because he'll try to move you out of the place because it doesn't appeal to your senses yet. Let me show you. When I started Woman Thou Art Loose, it was 40-some women in a Sunday school class. That didn't look like no place. That didn't look like nothing. I tell you what, it looked like this little section right here. This little section, just this one little section right here. This this section. That's what it looked like. That's why nobody wanted to invest in it. Nobody wanted to help me publish no book about it. Nobody wanted to pay for the book to be published. Nobody thought it was going to be anything. It was just a cute idea. Some guy talking to some women. But it was the place. You can't tell the place by judging through your senses. You have to go by your spirit to discern whether you're in the place or not. You can't go by the paycheck. You can't go by how handsome he is. You can't. You could be in the place 
and not know it because the place has been planted not created how to place me what, 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 how do I know when I'm in the place can I talk a few minutes about that how do I know when I'm in in the place first of all you have to discern it through the Holy Spirit okay through the Holy Spirit you can't go by your spirit you can't go by your feelings your feelings will betray you your feelings will trick you that's how Satan tricked Eve with her feelings you cannot trust your feelings you can't trust them I was just reading an article about Dave Thomas does anybody know who Dave Thomas is I was just reading an article about Dave Thomas and, 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 and how he passed and how he established Wendy's and, 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 and how he was the child of an unwed mother and uh, how somebody adopted him and then the, the, mother, the adoptive mother died and then the father was busy and, and how he never had good shoes on his feet and, and he never had anything going for him and he, he looked like he was absolutely going to be nothing. Oh, some of y'all don't know who Dave Thomas is. He owns Wendy's. He owned Wendy's, which did six billion dollars a year. Billy, Billy. <laughs> and <laughs> but he did not look like a winner. The article said he still won't show people his feet because he never wore the right shoes. Anybody would have identified him as a winner later. He dropped out of school. He had on shoes that didn't fit and he was a bus boy. It doesn't matter where you start it matters where you finish six billion dollars was in a bus boy Put your hand on your stomach. Say this with me. There's something in me that hadn't come out. It's been planted in my soul. God, help me to be stable and steadfast until you pull out of me what you planted in me. Now praise him if you meant that thing. Oh God. Woo. <laughs> oh God. Hallelujah. 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 Don't let anybody convince you that you're a failure just because you don't have on the right shoes, just because you're not there yet now, just because you don't have it all together right now. Walk in the power of God. Tell him God has a plan for my life. 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 God. No matter who had me, no matter who raised me, no matter who left me, no matter who forsook me, no matter what happened to me in my life, shout it, God has a plan for my life.
God. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but I'm preaching to somebody. I feel like just going to... Woo! Listen. I got to hear it. Sit down, sit down, because y'all don't y'all make me go crazy and stuff. a place this is a place this is a place God's planted your blessing don't give up don't give in don't give out don't give over stand wait on the Lord he may not come when you want him to come imagine the bus boys that probably didn't like Dave Thomas because they were all bussing tables but one of them had Wendy's in him do you think that when he got in the place God wanted him to be in that he cared about the bus boys that talked about him Why are you worrying God about stuff that doesn't even matter when this is just a game you playing on the way to growing up to becoming what God has for you to be? What are you saying, Jake? Count it all joy. Count it all joy. Count it all joy. How? How? Uh-oh. I I, I better shut this down because I feel... Sit down, I want to show you one more thing. Number four. When God got the prepared man and the garden planted and then placed the man in the planted garden, the last verse I had you to read, God told him to dress it or to prune. Number four is to prune the place God gave you. God said, I'm going to give it to you. I planted your blessings in it, but I'm still requiring human effort to fulfill divine prophecy. You got to prune your own garden. Stop looking for gardens that are already pruned. 
you got to prune your own garden. Oh, God. Mm. You got to go through your own struggles, shed your own tears, bust your own tables, work your own way up. Because you see, when people don't give you stuff and you work to get it, they can't take it from you. Oh, you don't hear what I'm saying. So God says, God says to him, I put you in the garden, but you got to dress it. You got, you got to prep it. You, you, you got to prep it. You got to prune it. You got to work with it. You got to weed it. You got to prune your own garden. You got to prune your children. They're not going to turn out right while you ignore them. Of course they got everything coming up in them. They're human like you. You got to prune them. Have to prune your relationship. You have to keep working on it. Nothing comes without a struggle. You have to prune the business. What's wrong with it? Figure it out. Sit up at night looking at it. Try it this way and try it that way and then try it over here and you ran out of money and you're in trouble now and you want to give up but you got to get back in there and try it over again because God already told you that he was going to do it and you're in the right place and if you just keep on pruning and pruning and I said, God, I don't understand why you put the man in the garden. You went, through, you went through so much trouble that you planted the garden. And then you told the man to dress it. Why didn't you just put him in there and let him eat? And I was reading up that certain kinds of vegetation, particularly those that we like to eat, even when they are planted, if they are not pruned, they die. Wheat left unattended will eventually seed itself to death and die. There's nothing wrong with your life except you're expecting God to do stuff that God is expecting you to do. Now you can dance and speak in tongues and fall out in the floor and prophesy, but you better get some scissors. I am a living witness. If you keep pruning while other people are playing, while they're quitting and giving up and trying new stuff and trying new stuff and trying new stuff, God won't bless you if you don't stick to stuff. All them years, Colonel Sanders didn't say but one thing. Everybody else switched. He's still, he's coming, he did. The company's still serving. You don't see Gladys Knight doing rap music? You know why? When you know you're in the place where God is going to bless you, you have to stick it out, tough it out, whether it's in style, out of style, people like it don't like it if God bless you to be good at it do what you I'll close with this and I want this to burn in your head I want to sear this in your forehead God has a plan for your life True repentance begins when you stop trying to live it your way and you submit yourself to him and say, Lord, whatever you will for me to do, that is what I'm going to do. Now, either you hear me now 
or you hear me when you're 60 or you hear me when you're 70 or your kids hear me after you're dead but sooner or later you're gonna finally realize all the stuff you are trying to do ain't gonna work and you don't need another failure in your life stand still and see the salvation of the Lord God has a plan for your life somebody shout it out God has a plan for my life God has a plan for my life God has a plan God has a plan God has a plan for my life stand to your feet through you know what I believe in heaven and I got a ticket and I want to go I believe in hell I canceled my reservations. I didn't like the accommodations and I decided I didn't want to go. But if there were no heaven and if there were no hell, I would serve God for what he does in my life right now. For the messes he gets me out of for not giving up on me, for teaching me and training me, for helping me and blessing me, for, for, for shining his light on my seeds, even when the seeds were buried beneath the soil. I came to him because he had a plan. And I needed a plan. I knew that at 16 years old, at 16 years old, I knew enough. I was dumb. I did a lot of dumb stuff since then. I do a lot of dumb stuff now, but I had enough sense to figure out that left to myself, I was going to kill my full self. Because being creative can be dangerous. Now you have to be creative to understand that. <laughs> if you're not creative, you don't know what I mean, and that just went over your head. But if you... God has a plan for your life. You can go through another year doing your thing, listening at your feelings, playing out your passions. But I'm gonna tell you something. Your passions ain't gonna never change. They're gonna always be crazy, deranged, ridiculous. And if you wanna go with them, just let them lead you. Everybody got them. Everybody got a temper. Everybody, even the little quiet people, they talk like that. Beneath all of that gentility, they have a temper. Everybody has lust. Is that some of us are too classy to look like it? <laughs> While other people wear their bedroom on their face. It's one thing for you to have something, it's another thing for it to have you. After a while, you say, ain't no need of me following you because you're just going to follow. You're just going to lead me to a ditch. Everybody gets lonely. Everybody gets lonely. Married people get lonely. Single people hear me. Married people get lonely. Getting married doesn't stop you from being lonely. Don't get married so you won't be lonely. You can still be lonely. Don't have kids so you won't be lonely. You can have a house full of kids. <laughs> you can have so many kids you look like the little old lady who lived in the shoe had so many kids she didn't know what to do 
be lonely. You can have four boyfriends, sister. Four of them. Get sick of all of them and be lonely. So since these things don't go away, since they will always come to abort the destiny of God in all of our lives, then why will we let them lead us when you have seeds in you? Close your eyes, put your hands on your stomach, I'm closing. And every person in this room, saved, unsaved, backslidden, there are potentials, seeds, planted by God in you. To the Christian, you've accepted the gardener that knows where your seeds are. And he sent the Holy Spirit to till your ground and bring fruit in your life. To the backslider, you threw more dirt on top of it, but the seed is still in there. To the sinner, you may not realize it, but there are seeds in you, you'll never find them. They're not in the bottle, they're not in the pipe. They're not in your lovers. That's why it just doesn't work. It just, every time you try it, it doesn't work. Only God knows where they are because he planted them. I'm not asking you to come to Christ so you won't go to hell or just so you'll go to heaven because you haven't seen heaven and you haven't seen hell but you've seen life. If you don't come to Christ, you'll never have the master plan for your life. And you'll end up being attracted to everybody who looks like they have it and spend 10 years finding out they don't. That they're just as confused as you are in one way or another. Eventually you'll come to God. There are seeds in you right now. Before those seeds die, why don't you come to Christ? I call every backslider, I call every sinner, come to Christ today. Our prayer room is open and available to you and all you need to do while we're praying is slip out into the house.